let's start in to give our speaker as much time as possible for his presentation. Uh, in many ways, I probably don't need to introduce Kent because he's been a, here a couple of times for us, uh, a dedicated friend of Trinity. So, uh, uh, in the past, uh, he has talked especially on issues of refugees and migration, something that he does a whole lot of work on uh, in his work at the university. Uh, he's also, are you still the uh, chair of the board at this at the uh, Civic Association? Yeah, American Civic, yeah, I'm still yes, president of the board. Very involved in that. But uh, uh, Kent, in fact, is, he's an associate professor of history. Uh, his, uh, his field, his specialty is Ottoman history. Uh, he did a book on uh, the Ottoman prisons in the late 19th century. He's co-edited, or he's, he's edited a number of volumes. So he uh, has a lot of activities there. Uh, he's worked on missionary history. Uh, so uh, sort of a really wide variety of things. Uh, but one of the things that he does is to uh, uh, teach Middle Eastern history. You know, and uh, uh, one of the key things, especially given what has been happening uh, for the last six months or so uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Gaza and so forth, uh, that uh, he has a presentation that I think will be very, very helpful to us, which is to put Palestine in a kind of historical perspective, uh, something that I think is very much needed these days. So, Kent, we're delighted to have you here. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation again. It's always a pleasure to come and, and, and talk with you, uh, particularly in light of very recent events of what happened last night and today, what's going on in terms of... Uh, uh, Iran's retaliation for uh, Israel's bomb their embassy in Syria. Um, these types of issues, it's ongoing, and, and the escalation is continuing uh, across the Middle East, whether it's in uh, Lebanon, uh, whether it's Hezbollah firing rockets into northern Israel and Israel striking places in, in, uh, in Lebanon or striking places in Syria, Houthis, uh, attacking ships through the Red Sea and into the Arabian Sea, whether it's, um, yeah, obviously those are tangential to what's happening in Gaza right now and what's been happening in the last six months. But it's also important to realize that what is happening there isn't, didn't just start with October 7th, right? It's important to understand that context. This is in no way any type of a justification for what Hamas did on October 7th or what they continue to do. It's also not a justification for what Israel is currently doing in Gaza and what's been ongoing in, in the West Bank. Uh, this is an, a conflict that dates back about 100 years. And it's not something that goes back to Isaac or Ishmael, or it's not all about Judaism versus Islam or those types of things. It is something that really has its roots in the last 100 years and is a direct result of European colonization and imperialism in the Middle East, but, and also the rise of nationalism, ethno-religious nationalism that has gone on in the Middle East. And so I guess to first try to demystify, I play with words, the bordering on, insan on insanity. We'll talk about the transformation of the borders a little bit, give some historical perspective to what's happening. Uh, but this is what I really want this to be focused on is human beings, right? Whether it's uh, Palestinians, whether it's Israelis, whether it's Palestinian Israelis, Jewish Israelis, Druze Israelis, Bedouin Israelis, you can go down the whole list. Um, Christians, Jews, Muslims, but it's not all about religion. And it's important to understand what the political aspects of this is and to have a focus on human beings. Uh, I think it's, it's incredibly important to do that because, um, this is often getting lost in the polemical political rhetoric from one nationalist movement against another or from one justification to another. And it's really important that we're focused on um, what is at the heart of this. And the vast majority of people who are being killed in, in these actions are innocent civilians, innocent children, women, and men who don't have a part in the fighting but are the ones indelibly that are subject to the violence and the biggest amount of destruction because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, so to speak. Not even, yeah, it's, it's not that they're wrong. It's just, this is what happens. And so I want to make sure we keep that focus. This is not, a, um, we're, I, I'm, I'm not about denigrating a particular people or a particular issue. This is, but the, the notion here is to focus on human life 
for me. That's that's my approach to this, right? Uh, to remember that these are human beings that are being subject to this type of violence, uh, that are being dispossessed and displaced, that are being attacked, that are being demonized. And that's important to try and... Uh, I want to set that as the context, right? Uh, because there's several things... In, I would I, I I would hope that we could do more of a QA as opposed to me lecturing at you, right? That's the that's the the notions because I'm assuming uh, this is this is quite a uh, educated group, a uh, group that has that has a lot of interests in the in the world around them and a lot of experiences. And so I'm very interested in in engaging the questions that you have. A little bit about my background. I got into Middle East studies uh, in the modern Middle East really through the Arab-Israeli conflict. Right, I had I had originally wanted to do my dissertation on this uh, on Pal the Palestinian Great Revolt of 1936 to 39, um, but that happened. I, I started grad school for my PhD program in 2000, and that's when the Second Intifada broke out, and Ramallah was in the West Bank was currently being leveled uh, by. Uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, and that was where I was going to do my dissertation research, and there was no way I could bring my family to there. So I shifted to, I had studied Arabic and Hebrew, modern Hebrew, and I shifted to Turkish and Ottoman Turkish, because I could go back in time there um, and look at the late 19th, early 20th centuries to the, to the origins of some of this, of, of, of the, this conflict that's ongoing. Um, and so that was always interesting. So I have always taught on this from now. I have a degree, a, a master's degree in Jewish studies uh, from Oxford. Um, I have, I was in the army and I learned Arabic as an enlisted soldier a long time ago. You know, there's a, so I, I come at this, come at this from a lot of different perspectives. And I think it's important to, to understand that, that there's a lot that can be done in this region and a lot that can be done regarding this particular issue that does not have to involve catastrophic use of military force, that does not have to utilize terrorist, terrorist activities, it does not have to utilize this stuff. And I think one of the problems is, is that there has been so little will in the international community to actually really provide the support and the pressure for the different parties to actually try to make significant changes in this area. So this is where those are that's some of my background and where I'm coming from. So you mentioned your family. What can you tell us, children, what age they are? Oh my kids? Yeah. They're all grown. <laughs> yeah. So the youngest is now a, a first year at Binghamton University in engineering. The uh the third oldest, we have four children. The third oldest is um a musician playing bluegrass in a band down in uh, Tennessee at some of the resorts down there, Anakista. If you all want to go down, that's over by Dollywood. It's a lot of fun. I'm I'm very proud of that. This, this is really fun. Um, and then I have uh, my two our two older children. Um, they're both graduated from college. They're married. They have. They're both engineers, and they both live in the area. So we're really. We're, we're really excited. I don't know. That's, that's sort of that. We have a girl and three boys, and we're really, really, we're very blessed to have them so close, except for the one that's in Tennessee. So if that, if that answered your question there. Um, so I, I wanted to start off. Let's see. This is not advancing the way it should. What's going on here? Okay. Something about... Okay, I'll just have to. I'll just have to do it this way. There we go. So I, I want to establish uh, the borders of the dispute a little bit. Okay, for those of you who aren't familiar with the geography so much, this uh, conflict rages over territory about the size of New Jersey. Okay, this is not a big place, right? Um, I think we're all familiar with how uh, the size of New Jersey here, and it roughly uh, it directly involves uh, fourteen and a half million people, maybe fifteen million people now, depending on. Well, you know, 9 million Israeli citizens, uh, whom over one-fourth of whom are Palestinian Israelis, and 5.5 million Palestinians in what would be the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, the conflict has raged for 90 years and claimed now probably about 180,000 lives, right? Almost going towards 200,000. Uh, terrorists and extremists have been and are elected to the highest offices by both people, by both peoples, they have been. 
Um, and this is a, this is a real problem. Uh, you know, uh, one people have the right to a viable, independent, sovereign state, but not the other. This is a this is a serious issue that is not very very well engaged. Um, one person's terrorist seems to be another person's freedom fighter, depending on which side you're talking about, right? Depending on who you're who you're supporting or who is part of your kinship tribe or however you want to however you want to look at it. One people appear to have a right to self defense, but the other does not. We you know these are these are serious issues in terms of how the how both peoples are talked about in the media and by politicians around the globe, um, you know, in terms of recognition or lack of recognition, how it's engaged. There seems to be a zero sum game approach to to this by many. Uh, much of the conflict can be summarized as a territorial dispute between two rival nationalist movements. Jewish, Israeli, and Palestinian. Right? This really is a territorial dispute. Two na nationalist movements, two nations that are claiming the same territory, the same piece of land for their homeland, for their nation state. So what are the alternatives? What, what, if you start from that basis, where do we go from there? Right. This isn't an issue of who's more legitimate than the other because one's been around longer than the other in terms of nationalist movements. If that was the case, wow, American nationalism would be totally, you know, <laughs> um, uh, uh, undermined. You know, the, the the notions of what our nationalism looks like today. Uh, so, if we if we start that with the assumption that both peoples have a right to the same territory. Where do we go from there when we think of it in that regard? When we see both groups as having legitimate claims, then what's the next step from there? Right. That and that's kind of how I this is how I approach it, this is how I teach it, this is how we talk about it, to try and demystify all of the rhetoric, all of the propaganda, all of the dehumanization, whether it's one side or the other, to be able to try to get at this situation, look at uh how do you try to respect individual sovereign rights individual rights and on on all sides right this doesn't need to be a zero-sum game but unfortunately so many the brinkmanship has really made it as as has perpetuated this idea that it's a zero-sum game and then finally borders and sovereignty continue to be one of the central issues of the dispute between palestinians and israelis since world war one right where can there be a Palestinian state? There is an Israeli state, right? There is not a Palestinian state. So what, what does that need to look like if we really are in favor of a two-state solution? If that really is the solution to this, what are we looking at and what does that need to be? Right. So, you know, there's lots of myths. I've already talked about a couple of them. You know, this idea that Zionism, which is Jewish nationalism, right, uh, is more legitimate than Palestinian nationalism because it came first. You know, that's that that seems problematic if we look at nationalism is a modern development, right? Nationalist movements come and go all the time. These are long, I mean, Confederate nationalism ideally is gone forever, right? The South will not rise again in the United States. But, you know, how come I see more Confederate flags in New York than I ever did in Tennessee? That's a different that's an, that's another point. I lived in Tennessee for five years, so that's an, that's another thing. But uh, this conflict, oftentimes, the Smith gets reduced to good versus evil, right versus wrong, modern versus backward, civilized versus barbaric, east versus west, or democracy versus dictatorship, victim versus perpetrator. Right? Uh, these dichotomies do not actually explain what is going on. This is this idea of an us and them notion that nationalism at its heart creates for all nationalist movements, right? How do we get over that in this case? This is this, these are the difficulties here, right? Uh, also that Israel equals the victim and Palestinian or Arab equals aggressor or terrorist. That's often, um, Palestinian has often been regarded as an adjective for terrorist, as an adjective for refugee as an adjective for something else than just a human being, right? Israel, an Israeli is often characterized as by, by different groups around the world 
again, as an adjective of an aggressor, as an adjective of an imperialist, as an adjective of a victim, needing support, this notion. And so how do we break those dehumanizations down, those essentialist character characteristics, and actually try to, to, to remember the humanity that's within both of these groups, which is often discarded quite quickly? Um, Israel has bent over backwards. Well, let's see, Palestinians should move somewhere else because the Arabs already have 21 states. That's one of these things that I hear quite a bit about, well, you know, why can't they just go to Jordan or someplace else? Well, I mean, think about it in this way. Iraqi or Syrian nationalism is very different from Palestinian nationalism. That's not their homeland. That's not where Palestinians claim their place. That would be like us in the United States saying, okay, swap with Australia. No, swap. Just swap. That's not the homeland that we have settled in, that we have become a part of, right? It's different. There are ties. There's importance to that. And so both sides have legitimate claims to this land as a nationalist movement, as a place. So where do we go from there, right? It's primarily that Israel is bent over backwards to make peace. Oh, that's nice propaganda. That Palestinians, it's all their fault that the peace process has failed. That's nice propaganda, right? Let's look at what both sides are, have been engaged in and doing. It's important to actually stick with the facts and humanize the people that are around those facts. Um, Israel and the Jews control American politics, please. Okay, can we, can we get rid of the anti-Semitism, please? Can we stop doing that? Do, do Jewish lobbies, Israeli lobbies have influence? Sure they do. So do uh, a variety of other lobbies have influence in the, in the United States politics. So again, let's stop demonizing one group, but look at the influence. Look at what's going on in and of itself without the dehumanizing aspects of it, right? I think it's important. One side has the corner of truth, right? Israel is in constant threat of annihilation. They are not. They are not. They are they have the most powerful military in the in the Middle East, right? They really do. They have a nuclear arsenal, right? They are, while there are threats against Israel, definitely. I'm not trying to, you know, completely, I'm not trying to uh, uh, deny that. That's, those are, there are real threats to Israel's security, its population, as we saw with October 7th, as we see with these things. Those are real, right? Uh, but it's not under the constant threat of annihilation, right? There is not another state in the Middle East that could take down Israel in terms of its military strength. Plus, it's, it's strong, unyielding support from the United States, right? Those are real things. Those are just facts. And th this also notion that Israel doesn't have a right to exist, that's often thrown out there. It's there. Whether you accept it as a legitimately created nation or not, state or not, regardless, it's there. It's real. People believe in it. People are part of it. People adopt this as their national identity. And it's important to global Jewry for, for, in, in many ways. And that has to be acknowledged. That cannot be ignored. On the flip side of that, this idea that a Palestinian state doesn't have the right to exist would be as equally undermining as equally dehumanizing as if saying Israel doesn't have the right to exist. So where do we go from there? Okay. So the borders of this conflict, right? This really goes, I, 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 I'm not going to go in huge detail with this. I teach whole classes on this, whole semester classes on this, but really briefly, this conflict does have its origins in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, uh, there, you know, the notions that, the Ottoman Levant or the Eastern Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire controlled the territories that are Israel Palestine today since 1517. They controlled those all the way up until 1917. So basically 400 years that they controlled these areas. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, there was no such thing as a palace as an Ottoman Palestine in the sense that it was its own administrative unit. There was no such thing as that during the Ottoman period, right? There was a region, 
that people would refer to as Palestine in their writings, that people could attach themselves to. But this notion of a Palestinian nationalism at this point in time didn't exist in this way. But if you think of it in terms of, say, um, a region that people have affinity to that's considered in a homeland where their roots, their families, these types of things, where they've moved to, moved from, go back to, this type of thing. We think of a, a kind of a cultural region of New England in the United States, right? New England, it's supposed to have some certain uh, coherence to it, but it's not a political unit. Think of that kind of of what maybe Ottoman Palestine would have been, okay? A place that didn't have a political designation, but there was a place that people said they were from, right? said that that's home, said where that was important to them type of a situation. I hope that makes some sense. Um, there's also the mandate Palestine after World War I and the Ottoman Empire was dissolved um, into a, a number of nation states and new territorial, new uh, um, imperial territories. You have the mandate Palestine. That's when the name Palestine came back as a political entity by the British creating mandate Palestine, right? Then, and there were, and that's when uh, post-World War I, when the British got mandates of former Ottoman territory like Iraq, what became Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, um, Egypt, Palestine, these types of places. Palestine was the only place that allowed large-scale European settlement meaning European Jews from Eastern Europe to come in and settle in that mandate. That was the only one. Iraq didn't have a large wave of European colonialists coming in. Neither did um, Kuwait, neither did Egypt, neither did uh, Jordan. Palestine mandate was the only one. So, and there was obviously rationales and reasons for that that I can get into. Then you have the, uh, in 1948, you have the creation of the state of Israel and the disappearance of Palestine, that was removed from the map, right? The territories that were part of the Palestine mandate became Jordan and Israel. Um, primarily, that little strip of land that's un currently under enormous military destruction, Gaza, was part of Egypt post-1948, or it was under the protector protection of Egypt, whereas Jordan annexed the West Bank as a, as a result of 1948. We'll get into that. The Six Days War changed that. This is where we have now uh, the West Bank was conquered and East Jerusalem was conquered by Israel as a result of the 1967 Six Days War, as was the Sinai, as was Gaza, as was the Golan Heights, which is part of Syria, right? Which is territorially supposed to be part of Syria, but Israel has annexed that. And so that's how these borders start to change. And we'll get into some maps real quick. But that's also when all of the settlements in the West Bank, the Israeli Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and what had been in, in Gaza until 2005, I'll get into that, were put in place. Where you had Israelis and the Israeli government supporting settlement to come and take territory in the West Bank and Gaza and create settlements for it. And there's a lot of rationales for why Israel has made those settlements and why it continues to support them that are ideological, security, economic, military, cultural, that type of a situation. So we can get into that a little bit if you wish. Then you had the Oslo Accords and their failure. That was 1990s. Everybody remember that wonderful, big, uh, optimistic time in 1993 when Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin um, shook hands on the White House lawn with Bill Clinton going like, you know, typical Bill Clinton right there uh, around the two, right? That was supposed to usher in the opportunity for a two-state solution to this, to this, these issues. And that was a complete fa failure. Um, you have then the Ga Gaza withdrawal in 2005 under uh, Ariel Sharon, who was prime minister of Israel that unilaterally withdrew the settlers the, and the settlements that were in Gaza, which were minimal. There was very few settlements compared to what we see in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And then into the situation of the security fence, the security border that's going on now where more territory of the West Bank is being annexed into Israel proper. Um, these, are, these are really 
important issues to understand the dynamic of what has happened over time. These are systemic. These are systemic actions. All right. And so, you know, map of the Ottoman Empire in uh, the yellow is for uh, at the start of World War One, where the, the empire was, how large it was at that point in time um, in 1914. In the late 19th century, you had Zionists, uh, Israeli, and uh, not Israeli, sorry, Jewish nationalists who were primarily in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, but primarily Eastern Europe that had come down into Ottoman lands in an attempt to, to settle in to Ottoman territories, fleeing the, the grotesque anti-Semitism and pogroms and the violence that was happening in Europe. Their desire was to establish a homeland, to establish a Jewish state. And many of them, as being practical about it, went and settled in the area. And for the most part, were quite welcomed by the Ottoman Empire, right? They had to take Ottoman citizenship. They had to renounce their citizenship where they were coming from, that type of a situation. Not unlike what most have to do when they immigrate to one, one place to another today. Um, this, that's, th those were the origins. And th that first wave, if you want to call it the first Aliyah, as it's, as it's said, uh, for Zionism, uh, coming into what is today... Uh, Israel Palestine, right? That first wave uh, worked with the local populations that were there. It was not about displacement necessarily. It was about carving out a place for themselves. Um, you know, early Zionism, there, there are many, many, just like there's many interpretations of American nationalism, what it means to be American, and that's hotly debated and contested. Uh, Zionism and Palestinian nationalism are very similar, right? Every nationalist movement argues amongst themselves about who is part of the nation and who's not, right? And so you, you have this, you know, there's a lot of varieties in Zionism. But one thing that's very important here to realize is that Zionism was never a major movement among European Jews until World War II, right? Um, you had probably at its height when we're talking, well, prior to the Holocaust, prior to the destruction of European Jewry by Nazism, right, and, and by anti-Semitism, Zionism probably had 50,000 adherents out of a population of 10 million Jews, right? It was not very popular at that point in time, but that became very galvanized as a result of the, the attempted complete destruction of, of Jews as a result of World War II. And that's important to, to acknowledge and realize for world Jewry about the importance of Israel to them, that this is a place where we determine ourselves, our, our future, right? The self-determination is in a very important aspect for them, and that should not be just tossed away. It needs to be acknowledged and supported, as is Palestinian self-determination, right? N neither of them should be tossed away. Because they, you know, if we live in a world of nationalisms and nation states, right, for good or ill, right, most of the time, in my opinion, ill, but that's, that's a different, that's a different topic. So, and both nationalisms are very viable. They both have a lot of adherence and a lot, and, and are very, very strong in terms of mobilizing people behind it. So they do have to be acknowledged. They just can't be written off. So, um, I already mentioned about Ottoman Palestine. Here are the various provinces in the Ottoman period, the sub-provinces of what we would call Israel-Palestine, and all the way up to, to Lebanon and part of Syria today uh, along the coast. These were broken up into different subsections, right? You had uh, the, the administrative sub-administrative province of Jerusalem because of its importance religiously to Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Uh, in, in the world, uh, but what's today, uh, Israel-Palestine was broken up into th by th among, administered by three different provinces, Beirut, Damascus, um, and, and, and others. Uh, it's important to understand from 1840 to 1914, the population of, I'm calling it Ottoman Palestine for lack of a different word, better, better term, doubled to 650,000 inhabitants. You had a lot of in-migration into this area. That included European Jews, but included folks from um, 
uh, Arabs from North Africa, that Amazigh populations that included a lot of different groups from around around the Middle East and also Europe from 1840 to 1914, so much so that about five-sixths of the population would be considered Arab, both Christian and Muslim at that point in time, up until 1914. Uh, less than one-sixth of the population was Jewish, about 80,000. And those are an indigenous Jewish population there, but also European Zionists moving in. Yes, please. So you said this is like a conglomerate, sort of like... Yeah. Brooklyn? Right. For it's just it's, it's it's not like one cult. It's not one. exactly. It's not one administrative uh, political unit, even up until 1914. Right, Palestine as a political entity did not exist. Let's put it that way. It wasn't a state or a province in the Ottoman Empire, but it was a region that people saw themselves belonging to. That's why I just use I use that example, the simile of of uh, New England, just to try and help people realize, okay, this is not a weird thing. We, we have regions that people, people ascribe to type of a situation, but don't necessarily, aren't necessarily political entities of themselves. So by 1914, by the start of World War I, less than one-sixth of the population uh, was not Arab, right? So 80,000 about were Jewish, about, and only about 25,000 of them were Zionists at the time meaning Jewish nationalists. You had an indigenous Jewish population that had been there for centuries, for a very long time in the area, that in some ways got along with, but also competed with, also scratched their head about these Jewish nationalists coming in from Europe, very different Jews than they were in terms of how they practiced, what languages they spoke, what their background and traditions were. It's important. It's, Jews are not monolithic. It's really important to realize that. Um, so I won't, I don't want to get bogged down in all these details, but it's really important. One of the things that really, uh, that, uh, that it's at the root of, of the Palestine mandate was the Balfour declaration. Those of you who are familiar with this, let me, in 1917, November, uh, in November of 1917, the British cabinet uh, issued a declaration called the Balfour Declaration, which, well, it's a two-paragraph. It's it's a very short, very small thing that was critically important to the Zionist cause. Very, very important. It said, I have much pleasure to in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government, this is to Chaim Weitzman in the World Zionist Organization specifically, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which have been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. I should be giving you my best British, you know, Queen's English interpretation here. Uh, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. That's the Balfour Declaration. That's it. Um, it does not say anything about a Jewish state in there. It's typical British diplomatic uh, um, parlance at this point in time, right? What, what do best endeavors mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> we we view with favor. Any of you who are familiar with British imperialism will know this is like carbon copy stuff that they talk to all sorts of populations around the globe during their heyday of empire. <laughs> Almost carbon copy, right, from one group to another. It's important to understand this, but this fulfilled the aspirations for Zionism. They finally got great power support for their for for their dreams. They read this and interpreted it as a Jewish state, that they were going to get this. And Winston Churchill, when he was colonial secretary after World War I, he incorporated this language almost verbatim into the Palestine Mandate Charter and supported this. And this was very important to Winston Churchill. This was very important to that. I wrote my master's thesis on this. So, you know, going into his own papers and reading that, this is very important to this cabinet and the notions of kind of, you, this was um, 
Lloyd George um, was known uh, known for his evangelicism, his millennial millennial nah, I cannot say this word. I always stumble over it. Uh, the millenarian um, goals, right? This idea that having a Jewish state, the regathering of the Jews, that's so important to much Christian uh, theology, right? In in preparation for the second coming of Jesus, right? This was key to it, and they saw themselves in this sort of um, uh, this this role this way, uh, and so it's it's critically important here to understand this became part of the ruling doctrine in the mandate that did privilege the Zionists over other groups because it's Jewish and non-Jewish. Right? There's no other organized group there. It's not that the non-Jews that hold other groups of that I talked about were united in who they were at this point in time, right? But it's it's specifically signaling out one group that their protections and their support for their nationalist aspirations would be supported through this. This was not given to the the other populations. This was not given to the one, the five sixth of the population that existed in Ottoman Palestine and now in the early. Uh, uh, British mandate, right? British Palestine mandate to have direct nationalist aspirations and support for their dreams, as the Jews were. This is this is important to understand. This this is just fact. This is not an ideological thing on my part. This is this is how the mandate structure was put in place. Its laws, its governance, its support, which did favor a vast minority of the population in the in in the mandate than the majority populations. And I, you know, I can't stress this enough of how important the mandate was in terms of helping fulfill Zionist aspirations, that they were the, the end goal that this was become of an eventual Jewish state. And that is a big, big, important part. And I can't stress that enough. I'm sorry if I'm belaboring it too much. There's all this other stuff about the mandate system. Others, you know, I, I'll get bogged down in too much detail if I go through this, but understanding that the Palestine mandate was different from all the other mandates that were given to France and Britain out of the Middle East territories and how it was governed, how it was set up, and who was favored in it. Okay, And that's important to understand. Because this also, this idea of the, 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 the mandates had real ramifications on Jews and other mandates. Because you had a large Jewish population throughout North Africa and the Middle East that had been long lived for millennia in these areas. And so it's important to understand that Jewish nationalist aspirations coming out of Europe were not necessarily supported by world Jewry at this point in time. Right? It's important to understand that. Um, I already talked about most of this. What, so here's, the, here's something that's very important, right? 89% of the population of Mandate Palestine opposed the mandate. Opposed it. Part of the mandate's charter given by the League of Nations explicitly stated that the populations in those mandates must be consulted and must be engaged for their governance. Must have, you know, <laughs> that was not done very well anywhere in the mandate system by the, by the British or the French, uh, but particularly in Palestine it was not either. Right? When you have 89% of the population that saw the mandate as illegitimate, they said, no, we want our independence. We don't want to be an imperial possession, and they adopted a position of non-cooperation with the British. Right? Hindsight gives us hopefully 2020 vision. You know, I can take off my glasses and I can see in hindsight hopefully better. But what that non-cooperation did was prevent them from actually making changes in the mandate for themselves to help with their own eventual self-determination. You know, we can go into high, uh, hindsight and say, you know, oh, well, the Palestinians have rejected these opportunities all the time. No, they haven't. In some ways, you can understand why they would reject it off the top. If it's 89% of the population that doesn't accept the British mandate and doesn't want it, but it hurts them in the long run because they don't get the infrastructural support. They don't get the same uh, training, the access, the economic development that the Jews of the mandate got and the, you know you can say hindsight 2020 you know what what it could have should have but you know 
that that was a, a, a serious problem. They they set themselves back this way in that regard. Um, from from my perspective, and so colonial powers, the colonial powers in these places, they destroyed the econo the the local economy, uh, the local Palestinian economy in many ways because the mandates were under uh, free trade rules. They couldn't put up tariffs or barriers. And so the Palestinian economy was primarily agrarian. And so when the Great Depression happened, the United States dumped all sorts of agricultural products on the, on the mandates, not just the U.S., but so did Britain and others, uh, because this was a place for them to be able to, to sell these things. And it really destroyed the Palestinian economy. The Jewish economy, there's really kind of two economies here in the mandate. The Jewish economy was able to survive because they did have international support among global Jewry in certain ways. There was investment. There was some support there that the Palestinians didn't have recourse to outside of that territory. And so that did help the, the Jewish economy in a way that the Palestinian economy didn't have access to, and it hurt them. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm getting bogged down in too many details. But this is what the British mandate looked like in 1920. Winston Churchill at the Cairo Conference in 1921. You'll, you'll recognize that the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, it was part of the original Palestine mandate. And Winston Churchill at the Cairo Conference in 1921 split it in half, made Transjordan and gave it to Abdullah, who is, the, who is from uh, the, Hussein, the Husseini Hashemite family in, that was controlling Mecca and Medina at that point in time. Any of you familiar with Lawrence of Arabia, right? The, the Arab revolts, you know, um, that type of a situation. That was that family, the Hashemite family, that led that great Arab revolt with uh, T.E. Lawrence. And so Abdullah, one of the sons, one of the, one of the core, was given by the British Transjordan, split the, the Palestine mandate, gave what is today Jordan to the Hashemite family, to Abdullah, and his family still rules. His descendants still rule in Jordan today, right? So Britain, they were kingmakers here. Uh, Abdullah's brother Faisal was given Iraq as to be king, king of Iraq at that point. The, the, what was first the Mesopotamian mandate, now the, the, the became Iraq. Uh, so this, so this was cut in half. Well, not even in half, but this was what the mandate looked like. And in 1937, as a result of the Palestinian Great Revolt against uh, European Jewish immigration into the area, against what they saw as um, incredible discrimination against them, this type of a situation. There was a huge revolt, and you had a Peel Commission come in, the Peel Commission come in from, uh, from Britain um, and proposed a two-state solution at this point in time, an Arab state and a Jewish state, right? And the proposed Jewish state was in the purple, or the mauve, or however, whatever color you want to call it, and the proposed Arab state was in the green, and then there would be an international territory around Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and these areas. Um, that was what was proposed. Both sides didn't like it. Um, it was not accepted, uh, but very important to understand, be, one of the reasons particularly that the Palestinian Arabs rejected it was that they were still the majority in both areas. They were still the majority of the population in these areas. Um, this is the, you know, so Keep keep your eye on the this the the partition plan in 1937, and then the partition plan in 1948 that was put together. Right, it's uh, quite the opposite of what it was. Right, the proposed Arab state would now be the brown areas. The proposed Jewish state would be the blue areas. Right, that's very different from what was proposed just a decade earlier. Okay, um, that. That in 1947, this partition plan that was put forward as Brit as Britain was withdrawing from the mandate, they uh, they they the the Palestinian populations rejected this. The Jewish uh, the Zionist population accepted this at this point in time, and then you had Britain withdrew from the mandate. They said we're not going to control this anymore. We're going to give it to the successor to the League of Nations, the United Nations, and we'll withdraw. And when they withdrew in 1948. Um, you had Israel declare its independence, the Yom Ha'atzmaut, right? The, the, the day of independence. And then you had, uh, the Arab surrounding Arab states invade. Right? And you had the war of 1948 here where with, which established the borders of the state of Israel to this day. So this was what 
Israel accepted the Jewish population that, that controlled, uh, well, the, the Jewish government that controlled the Jewish population in the mandate accepted. And this is what they conquered and took as a result of the 1948 war. The, the purple sections are where they took more, more areas. And so there was no Arab state that was formed out of this, right? And so it's important, this, uh, of what happened. This is also, so for, uh, for Palestinians in particular, this was called the catastrophe, the Nakba, which resulted in, uh, at that point, the expulsion of over 700,000 Palestinians from what became Israel proper. And that's what we have the refugee crisis that continues until this day, the Palestinian refugee crisis. This shifted the conflict now uh, that was between two peoples, Palestinians and Zionists, or, or uh, Jews at that point in time, to now one between states, the state of Israel and the surrounding Arab states. The Palestinians dropped out of the negotiation uh, equation here. And that's how the peace process, so to speak, continued from that point forward was between states, with Palestinians not part of the discussion. Okay. This is the Palestinian refugee crisis. That is ongoing until today. Now it's over 1.8 million Palestinians living in refugee camps in the West Bank, in Gaza, and the surrounding Arab states. Right? This has not been. They they are not governed under the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, like every other refugee in the entire world is. They have a different status that doesn't give them the same rights as other refugees do in the entire globe. This is a different situation, um, which is. You know, why the exceptionalism? I, I think it's important. Uh, the borders of the Six Days War, this was a dramatic uh, win by Israel in six days, conquering the Sinai, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights, taking those territories. Uh, it was a huge shift for Israel itself. Right? This became less about their existence, because their existence was seriously challenged prior to this, but with their complete uh, destruction of the other Arab states' armies, Syria, Jordan, uh, Egypt, and Lebanon's, you know, they're, they're, they weren't in an existential crisis, although many in Israel still claim they're in an existential crisis in terms of being wiped off the map, where they were, it was, it was uh, very tenuous up until this, this time, and with the Six Days War, it was a dramatic Israeli win. Um, so Israeli control of the Palestinian territory since 1967, basically in the West Bank and Gaza. You have huge Israeli settlement construction for military, ideological, economic, and political rationales. You have over 500,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. right? Um, and it's a very controversial issue with Israeli and Palestinian societies both wanting Jerusalem as their capital, as the capital of their their what they want as their homeland as their nation state this has become very controversial and so you have basically israel controlling 80 percent of historic palestine going back to the mandate right uh with what would be an eventual could be an eventual um palestinian state split into two spots and representing about 20 percent of historic palestine and so that's that's where the oslo accords originated out of, right? This notion that there will be a two-state solution, one for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, and the other continued one in, in Israel proper. But that's not how the Oslo Accords uh, uh, worked out. So these were, prior to the 2005, the small Israeli settlements that were in Gaza, right? Small more. And you can see where all the blue, uh, the blue tents, the blue triangles there, all the, the, the Jewish settlements, the Israeli settlements in the West Bank, and how it's carved up and, and bifurcated this way. Well, more than bifurcated. But, you know, um, as we get through with the Oslo Peace Accords, right, that amazing, uh, the, the, the hope that came in so many places that would resolve this, this conflict between these two peoples, um, it was really quite problematic, though. Uh, it was supposed to be just a five-year. It was only supposed to take five years. It stretched to almost 20 before it was completely killed out. Well, no, I'm sorry. Not almost 20. Uh, a decade before it was completely killed off. 
but you had an unequal recognition recognition between the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and Israel, right? Israel recognized the Palestinian people for the first time. If you go to Israel today, in Israeli textbooks and other things, they don't refer to the Arab citizens of Israel as Palestinians. They refer to them as Arabs. There's this, been this constant denial of identity of Palestinianness for a very long time within Israel proper, even according to their laws, how they talk about it in the textbooks, and the Arab citizens of Israel. Uh, Palestinians are referred to those in Israel proper as those who live in the West Bank or Gaza or in the refugee camps outside. Uh, but for the first time, you have a Palestinian people that's recognized by the state of Israel, by Yitzhak Rabin as prime minister of Oslo Accords. And this is a big this is an important issue, but Israel did not recognize the Palestinians' right to a state. They recognized a right to self-governance within these territories. That's important to notice. It's kind of a flip from the Balfour Declaration, right, to then what you get here in the Oslo Accords. There's Palestinian self-rule that's created, right? They create the Palestinian Authority. That's where it comes from now, the PA, as it's referred to oftentimes. Yasser Arafat is the chairman. He was the chairman of it until he died under very mysterious circumstances um, in the, in uh, what was it, 2007? No, 2000. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the exact date. Uh, there were, they created zones A, B, and C, as you can see on the, on, the, on the map here. A has full Palestinian control. That's the brown, the dark brown areas. That's where full Palestinian control was given. B was supposed to be administered uh, it's Palestinian administration, but Israeli security. So there's a joint control over it. That's all the yellow, right? And then area C, the white, was supposed to be still negotiated, but that was completely controlled by Israel. So this was supposed to go over five years where there would be gradual expansion of Palestinian self-rule. The international community saw this as a possible two-state solution. That was not necessarily Israel's goal entering into this. Um, and this goes all back to the notion. So this map that you see here uh, is Palestinian self-rule as of 2000, so seven years into the, uh, the Oslo Accords. These were the letters of mutual recognition between Yitzhak Rabin and Arafat, right? This is everything that Arafat had to agree to, basically. Yes, we recognize the state of Israel. Yes, it's there. Yes, we will get rid of our... Uh, the stuff in our the PLO charter that declares the wanting to wipe out the existence of Israel, these types of things, right? They had to do make a lot of changes. Whereas Yitzhak Rabin's was in response to your letter of September 9th, this one, I wish to inform you that in light of the PLO's commitments included in your letter, the government of Israel has decided to recognize the Palestine Liberation Organization as the representative of the Palestinian people and commence negotiations with the PLO within the Middle East peace process. There is a big difference in terms of recognition and what was needed by both sides. What Yasser Arafat did was agree, was take Israel proper, 80% of historic Palestine, off the map for what could be a future Palestinian state. That's important to remember because that seriously undermined his own credibility, uh, Arafat's credibility among the Palestinian peoples at that point in time too, even though he kept winning elections, right? This was problematic. This is where you had these opposition groups to the PA, to uh, Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Authority coming, like Hamas, Islamic Jihad in Palestine, these types of things. These groups that came were in direct uh, opposition to Yasser Arafat's commitment here. And it's a big deal. This, this accord failed for many reasons. Uh, one of the big ones, and this is where we get sort of into this current situation here, that brings us up to it, is that both sides contained elements ideologically opposed to the peace process. Hamas completely opposed to the peace process, completely opposed to having taken off 80% of historic Palestine from what could be their future Palestinian state. Hamas is, um, is an Islamic nationalist movement about Palestine. This is not, they're not the same as Al-Qaeda or ISIS or any group like that. They are a Palestinian nationalist movement that has a very strict interpretation of Sunni Islam and imposes that upon, wants to pose that upon Palestinian society. They have heavily persecuted Palestinian Christians and other groups that don't fit within their ideology. And obviously they've engaged in atrocious 
um, terrorist attacks against Israel proper and its own populations, right? Hamas was against this from the start. Then you had the Likud and the religious parties in Israel that have been against this from the start because most of them are territorial maximalists. They want the West Bank. Some even want Jordan. Claiming that's uh, ancient Israeli territory, these types of things. Uh, the leader of Likud there, the one who really destroyed the Oslo Accords, was none other than Benjamin Netanyahu, who was in power after Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated in 1995. He came to power based on a, a platform of security because Hamas had been engaging in waves of terrorist bombings, bus bombings, and other things in Israel proper. That's how he came to power. And he has been trying to undermine this notion of a two-state solution ever since. This is where he is coming from. He currently has the most, the most nationalist uh, and hawkish government that Israel has known, has put together. It's the farthest right you've ever had of an Israeli government that he's currently put together. And he wasn't even, he didn't receive the electoral mandate to form this government. The way Israeli politics works, it's a um, coalition government, right? There's multi, it's a multi-party system in their parliament. And whoever gets the most votes is allowed to form a cabinet, a form of government, and control the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, right, at that point in time. He got, his party got second place, but the first place party couldn't form a government, couldn't get the coalition together, so it went to the second place party. And that's how Benjamin Netanyahu is in power today with this. So you have these two extreme sides that are now controlling, Hamas con was controlling Gaza's government, right? And you have the Likud, you have Benjamin Netanyahu in his very extreme government controlling Israeli politics and the IDF. This is the brinksmanship that we've gotten to on both sides in this regard. And it's important to understand that context. I hope that makes some sense there. Um, so uh, what you have during the Oslo Accord, another reason, a big reason why it, it failed was that Israel actually doubled the number of settlers and expanded settlements and built access roads and occupied territories during Oslo. It actually doubled the number of settlers and settlements in the West Bank in the 20% of Palestinian territory where a future Palestinian state was supposed to be made out of the West Bank and Gaza. So it's important to understand how both sides undermined this peace process and what was going on. Palestinian Authority is woefully corrupt and quite brutal to their own populations. They don't have a lot of legitimacy anymore among Palestinians in the West Bank. That's where the Palestinian Authority is set up. Hamas won elections in Gaza in 2006 and formed the government there. And then there was a small civil war within Gaza in 2006 and 7 where they kicked out the rest of the Palestinian Authority, the rest of Yasser Arafat's uh, governing coalition there. And so, you know, this is where we get to this point. So many sides with different visions of what a Palestine and Israel is supposed to look like. And we've gotten to this point now where we're at. Um, I, I think I should probably end it there. So I'm almost all out of time. There, I'm sure there's lots of questions and other things. But what we have going on in Gaza right now uh, qualifies under all definitions of mass atrocity of what's happening. Um, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention on campus. That's IGMAP. I had this training. I, I work on issues of mass atrocity. This, what's happening in Gaza is textbook. What Hamas did in its attacks on October 7th was textbook pogrom, textbook type of brutalization of innocent civilians there in Israel. That 1,200 and then the 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 those they they killed and then the, the and then those they kidnapped though does not justify the killing of over thirty three thousand and the leveling of Gaza. There are a lot of counter terrorist measures that need to be taken that could be taken that haven't been, except for just this this, this brutality on both sides of this. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>
Thank I know. You. Sorry. I could go on and on. I'm sorry. I'm happy to take more questions. I know people have to go to do other things. Time, but, but at least a couple of questions we could do. Please. Um, that was a very good presentation. When you look at a body of water and you throw a stone in it, you see the, the wave leaving and it ripples out. Yeah. This problem started with the Berlin Congress. In 1878. Yep. Where the European government sat down and divided the whole of Africa between themselves. Yep. That's why Africa is not where it can be. And all of this time with the British government. And this is their template. And that is where the problem is. Another thing to consider here is that most of the Ashkenazi Jews now moved back to the Middle East. That moved to the Middle East. They didn't. It's not back. They didn't live there. The people themselves hadn't lived there. Yeah. Thanks for the correction. Sorry. Came from Europe, yeah. so they speak the language of the people who are in the power. And emotion is what happened with the people that they meet on the land there, where they didn't know how to negotiate to get a seat at the table. And anytime you put religion into this, it becomes an emotional thing. So you look at the Hamas and the religious fanatics on the Islamic side and the Zionists on the Israeli side. And both of them are using religion as a justification. And once you have that, you don't have anywhere to have a conversation. It's when you have the extremes on both sides that are controlling the narrative. Yes. That's where the real problem happens. Because this is one thing, and thank you. I'm sorry. Is there more to your comment? I don't. No, no, no. Oh, that was yeah, it. yeah, no. I one thing that I uh, that really upsets me about the way media coverage looks at is that they ignore all of these efforts between Israelis and Palestinians to build these bridges. There are serious efforts between two sides. There are massive movements. I'm not talking millions and millions, but there are very large movements of populations trying to build bridges amongst. In, in amongst themselves but these extremists on both sides really have monopolized and you know militarized these these efforts so these extreme religious parties of uh on on the israeli side and the extreme religious parties if you want to use that term with hamas hezbollah that hezbollah but islamic jihad others on the palestinian side you know you get a similar foil there that does. And I, you know, I thank you very much for your comment. I appreciate it. Please. You said those things that could be done that aren't being done, such as? <laughs> such as a lot, what a lot of these groups that don't get um, focus. Well, one of the things that would be very easy for Israel proper to do is to give its Palestinian citizens full rights of citizenship. That's an easy thing. I mean, easy. That's within Israel's power to do. Easier said than done. Yeah, exactly, because of the issues inside. But that is something completely within Israel's control to do. And do you think the far right? That's one of them. That's one of them. If that's okay. There's there's a lot there's a lot more, but I don't yeah, I I, I I could go on and on. How much do you yeah, I mean that's one thing quite easy. Another thing is just basic self-determination. Israel for Gaza itself controls its airspace, controls its borders, its water table, and its electrical grid. It has. Since it's withdrawn, well, since 1967, right? it has that control. Giving self-determination to populations. Hamas has basically held much of its population in Gaza hostage to its whims. It has wasted so much money and resources building these extensive tunnel networks that should have gone to its own population in terms of helping to support that. Those are some basic things in, in that regard. Cutting them off and creating Palestine, uh, the Gaza into an open-air prison Right, I don't know how many of you've seen Escape from New York, the old Ron, uh, John Carpenter film back in the early '80s, <laughs> or Manhattan is turned into an open air prison. I, there's a lot there that's similar to how Gaza's been treated. Those are things that could be broken down. That don't look. Police action is necessary, but complete military action like this is not. Right, I'm not a pacifist. There are crazy, awful people out there that will take their life and take others, innocent lives. There are. Those need to be part. But an entire population? 
punished for that? Yeah, there's, there's, that's just a few of them. Uh, please. No, I was going to say, um, the far right, um, well, the coup party, you know, you think their ultimate goal is to totally eliminate the Palestinians from the West Bank, and uh, not West Bank, from Gaza? Um, look, you have genocidal speeches and genocidal comments coming out from some of the uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet members talking about complete displacement, wiping out that not allowing people to return, not allowing it to be rebuilt, that type of a situation. That is, that's, that's, you know, uh, that could be whether that wins out with the broader Israeli population. That's very disenchanted with what not Yahoo and the, not bringing home the hostages, not really focusing on that part of it. Um, has been has been a serious problem to undermine. It, there are elements in Israeli society, particularly in this government, that would like to see that happen. Would like to see that happen. Well, we are a little. Uh, oh, um, uh, what's your question. reaction? Do you think the hostages are alive? Um, I don't know how most of them could be anymore. To be really quite honest, right? Whether it's because of factions within mm -hmm. Gaza. And because not Hamas doesn't control all of the hostages, and they have their own factions that they're that they're work, that they're fighting against internally, and then obviously externally with Israel, Israel's invasion of Gaza. There, you know, this long into it, I, I'm pessimistic. Let's put it that way, and it's it's horrifying. It's horrifying. Please, um, I'm wondering what you think of Biden's position in uh, politics. <laughs> Um, regardless of which administration is in power, if it's, um, if it's a Republican or Democrat, they have supported and they have not been a fair negotiator between Palestinians and Israelis. They have not. Um, Biden's position has been horrifying to me uh, on the on stage. Basically, if you, if you compare what Biden said about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what they said about uh, Israel's invasion of Gaza. There, it's it, there's there's a huge disconnect there. I, I I'm uh, it's horrifying how easy it is to dehumanize Palestinians, um, and 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 not others. I think um, I'm I'm very <laughs> I'm very concerned about Biden's lack of action and unwillingness to hold Netanyahu and his extreme government. Uh, accountable in this. Bye. So, on that cheerful note, <laughs> thank you so much, Ken. Thanks.